Hello, this is Pastor Patrick Hines, and going to do a, an episode of the Reformed Presbyterian Pulpit Supplemental. And today I want to talk about uh, how to find a church. How do you find a church? And what are the marks of a Christian church? And what is it that you look for? I get emails from people all over the country, um, especially since my dear brother um, Richard has been posting uh, some of my sermons on his um, much, much, much larger YouTube channel that has, I think, over over 300,000 subscribers. So I get um, a lot of email now from folks that, that listen in um, and more people are listening on Sermon Audio, which is great, which is great. And, you know, the thing is, uh, the church that uh, the Lord has called me to here is a, it's a smaller congregation. We probably, we probably average about 130, 140 on a Sunday, maybe 70, um, between 60 and 80, you know, 70 or so on, on Sunday evening. So we're not a we're not a big church, and I, I doubt we ever will be. Um, but it's been a huge blessing to me to be in this church and to, to preach here and, and teach here. And the issue of finding a church is is getting tougher today because of all the compromise and because our the cultural push to be woke and the cultural push to be LGBT affirming and all the all the weird new words and phrases like side B and everything else, all this stuff that, that's happening now is dramatically affecting um, the, the pockets of biblical Christianity that are left in the United States. And, it, and it's affecting them in a very negative way. Um, the, the bad theology and the unbelief and the apostasy um, is really winning the day. And more and more... Um, I get emails from folks, you know, where should we go to church? Where should we go to church? I'm like, I don't know. I I wish I could just wholesale recommend a denomination. I mean, we're in a little denomination, Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church. We only have five churches. Um, I'd recommend all of them. I mean, they're they're great, they're, you know, great men of God who, who dearly love the truth and are going to uphold and stand for the truth and preach the true gospel. Um, but I just tell people you have to talk to elders. You got to you got to meet the elders of, of a local church and you kind of you need to try to get a feel for where they're coming from and what they believe and where they stand on the cultural issues and you, you need to ask them uh, about side b christianity the idea of gay celibate christianity you need to ask them do they believe in the concept of sexual orientation and things like that and do they believe in uh, all the stuff about race and uh, critical race theory and uh, things like that but most importantly i mean the, those are important cultural issues, which you, you also need to find out. What do they preach when it comes to the gospel? Um, do they believe uh, in the true gospel? Do they affirm justification by faith alone? And, and is that what they preach and teach? And do they have an understanding of the Christian life that's biblical and things like that? But also that they worship biblically and that the way they conduct their churches is, bibli is biblical. So I did a sermon um, back in 2018. Uh, it was my Reformation sermon. It was the Reformation and uh, Biblical Ecclesiology. The, the word ecclesiology is simply your doctrine of the church, not, not the doctrines that are believed by the church, but what you think a church is or what the church is and what you think the New Testament and the Old Testament, what the whole Bible teaches about the nature of the Christian church. It's very important that people have a biblical doctrine of the church uh, of the visible church, the invisible church, um, the marks of the church, what the uh, ministry of the church is supposed to be, and the discipline of the church, and all that kind of stuff, um, is extremely important uh, to people's spiritual well-being. So, with that, I'd like to go through some of my sermon notes here and just make some comments along the way. Um, in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus uh, said, I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock, meaning Peter's confession that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church in that the church will never, it will never disappear. There will always be a church in the world to worship Christ until the end of time. Um, the gates of hell will not prevail against it, but the church uh, has always been the special target of the concerted hatred <clears throat> of the hosts of hell and the enemies of God. From the day that Cain killed Abel, to the day that Ishmael mocked and threatened Isaac, <clears throat> to the day the church was reduced to eight in the ark, Noah's ark, uh, to the day only 7,000 faithful Israelites <clears throat> excuse me, remained in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, when Elijah, though he was, thought he was the only one left, uh, to the days Josiah tore his robes at the reading of the rediscovered book of the law, to the days when our brothers and sisters were, in a mocking fashion, turned into human candles to light the evil Emperor Nero's garden parties, 
to the days in which Athanasius stood against the world, contramundum, against the world, in defense of the full deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the days in which Christ's followers retreated into the Alps and lived uninfluenced by papal Rome for centuries until at the, in the Piedmont Valley, uh, they were at last breached by the Pope's armies where they were massacred and the peaceful Christian men, women, and children who lived there in the Middle Ages um, uh, were massacred by the Pope's armies. I wonder if, um, if the people in the Piedmont Valley thought that they were just separated brethren, as uh, Vatican II calls us today, uh, or if they thought maybe they were something else. All the way to the morning star of the Reformation with uh, John Wycliffe and his efforts to preach the gospel, to translate the Bible into English so we could read it. Um, and he, Wycliffe denounced the Roman uh, Curia as a synagogue of Satan um, and spurned the Roman mass as a blasphemy. And then you get to Luther and John Huss, 100 years before Luther, shortly after Wycliffe, Calvin, the Puritans, etc., Church history is the story of Jesus building and refining his church in the world. And we all need to ask this question, why are we here as repentant believers in Christ alone? Why, why are there people who are true believers in Christ who will watch this video and hopefully they have a church home that they can go where they, they, the word is rightly preached, the sacraments are administered. Why are we here? Why are there Christians in the world today? Because Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of Hades will not prevail against my church. Try as they may, the gates of hell will not stop the forward progress of Christ's church in the world. And the fact that I'm a Christian and a minister of the gospel, and that you're a Christian if you are a believer, um, is proof that what Jesus said is true. Um, we sit here as proof of his promise, the gates of hell will not prevail. And that great hymn, it's one of my favorite hymns, uh, the church's one foundation has two memorable verses which speak directly to this issue. Though with a scornful wonder we see her sore oppressed by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed, yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up how long, and soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore, till with the vision glorious her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. It's hard to read that or think about singing that without getting teary-eyed. Now, one thing that I've preached on many times, I did this past Reformation Sunday, uh, is the blessed doctrine of justification by faith alone. That is the doctrinal article by which the Christian church stands or falls. Get that one wrong, it doesn't matter where else you're right. You're not a Christian. And always remember, I've said this many times, and I will <clears throat> repeat this many more times, Lord willing, as long as there's strength and breath in my body, uh, justification by faith alone, what that really means is that we're justified by the righteousness of Christ alone. And that what a Christian's relying on to get them into heaven is none other than the shed blood and the imputed righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Now, I lost my place. I started preaching here. Sorry. Um, all right. Ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. This was another extremely important doctrine that was in grave need of reformation during the 16th century. Um, what is a church? What, the doctrine of the church, meaning what is a, ch a church? A local church, what is the universal church? What is the visible church, the invisible church? What are the marks of the church? What is the biblical teaching about the church? What is meant when scripture speaks of there being one and only one church for whom Christ died? Ephesians 5, 25 speaks of the church in that way. Husbands, love your wife. as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Well, that's obviously not talking about just one local congregation. That's talking about the, using the word church in a, in a certain sense. Because this precious doctrine of the church has been overlooked, many have left true churches for the barren wastelands of Rome and Constantinople over the past few decades. Understanding biblical ecclesiology is therefore essential to us. There's a long list of books by converts to both groups, to Rome and the East, that have come out recently. And we need to have a biblical understanding of the church and its membership. Because one thing I've noticed in reading convert stories to both Eastern Orthodoxy and to Roman Catholicism, many times their arguments are, are almost indistinguishable from one another. From one another. But one thing's clear that uh, that was missing in those people's understanding was a biblical ecclesiology. In fact, if you look in the archives, I did a I did a whole program on Rome and the East's utterly anti-Christian, anti-scriptural doctrine of the church. They have no idea what the Christian church is. None. 
They're totally, completely wrong. The idea that, well, we can trace our ordinations back to, to the, the bishops and the tradition that was passed on or whatever. Uh, we, we ought to know that it doesn't matter who ordained you. It doesn't matter if you can trace your ordinations back to whoever. The only thing that matters is what do you teach? And the thing for me, I couldn't care less if someone could trace the ordination of their bishops or their presbyters or their metropolitans or whatever you want to call them all the way back to one of the apostles. If you don't teach what the apostles taught, what difference does it make then? Paul himself taught uh, in Acts chapter 20 to the Ephesian elders. He said that false teachers, wolves would, would arise from within their midst. So it really doesn't matter who your teachers were or who ordained you. The only thing that matters is, do you teach what the apostles of Jesus Christ taught? And there's only one place we know where we can find what the apostles taught, and that is Scripture alone. So what is the church? What is meant when Scripture speaks of the church at Corinth, or the, the church at Rome, or the church in Thessalonica? Those are talking about specific local gatherings of believers and their children. That's one of the things that's very important. It took me a while to get my head around that part, but um, I always thought, no, 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 the, the, the church is all that profess to be believers in Jesus Christ and are baptized, and I, I learned from the Old Testament and the New Testament that's actually not quite accurate. The, the visible church is all who profess to know Christ and their households and their children. They're part of the Christian church together. When the Reformation of the 16th century happened, and it became clear that the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic religion and the papacy were not going to be corrected by scripture of their many errors, one great doctrine that came into the foreground was the biblical doctrine of the church. In the ancient church, for the first few centuries after Christ, as the church dealt with deadly errors concerning the doctrine of God and of Christ, they published creeds on those matters. Contained in those creeds were affirmations concerning the attributes of the true Christian church. I can't emphasize to you how important this is. And those early creeds summarize quite well what scripture taught about the nature of the church. And what was originally called the old Roman symbol, which was the forerunner of the Apostles' Creed, a reference was made to the holy church. And one of those very, very, very early creeds, the holy church. The Apostles' Creed speaks itself of the Holy Catholic Church, meaning universal, the Holy Universal Church. The Nicene Creed of 325 AD speaks of the Catholic and Apostolic Church. Then in 381, what is known as the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, we find the first use of the four classical biblical attributes of the Church. One, Holy, Catholic, or Universal, and Apostolic. So one, Holy, Catholic, Apostolic. All four of those attributes are appropriate descriptions of Jesus' church, okay? So that's the first thing that we need to get. There's four apostolic marks of the church that you see there, and those real old ancient creeds, and those are really good summaries. As we're going to see, I've got just scores of passages cited here. There's those four attributes of the Christian church, one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. And then the Reformation comes in the 16th century and adds three more. The right preaching of the word of God, the right administration of the sacraments, and church discipline. So there's seven. There's one holy Catholic apostolic, the correct preaching of the word of God, meaning the gospel is correct in the preaching, uh, the right administration of the sacraments, and then church discipline. And those are actually related. All, all three of those additional marks that the Reformation added are related to the four apostolic marks, one holy Catholic apostolic, but you'll see that here in a moment. So first, the church's oneness. What do we mean what have Christians all over the world meant when they confess that there is one church, as one holy Catholic apostolic? What do they mean by the word one? First, it needs to be said that tragically and sadly, the church in this world hardly looks to be one in a visible sense. And it must be said that institutional uniformity, as we see somewhat in the Roman Catholic religion and also Eastern Orthodoxy, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. That's not what Jesus is talking about in John 10, 16. There will be one flock and one shepherd. He's not talking about institutional uniformity. That's not the, the oneness that he, he's addressing. In John 17, 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. Now, I think it's extremely important that when that verse is quoted to say, see, we should all be together, um, the Roman Catholics and Presbyterians and Methodists and Baptists and Eastern Orthodox, Jesus prayed that we would all be one. 
And as if what Jesus is really saying is, boy, I sure am hoping it works out well. And I, I sure do. I sure do hope that there'll be one. Every Christian, no matter what denomination that they're in. Okay. And obviously I don't think Rome or Eastern Orthodox are denominations. Those are apostate false religions, but no matter what denominational label a person wears, if they believe in Jesus Christ alone as their savior and as their full salvation, um, they are baptized into the one church. There's one body of Christ in the world. It has different denominational expressions, uh, but it, there's one church. And the, and the disciples of Christ are one. They are one. We are one with our uh, Baptist friends who are true believers. We're one with our uh, Methodist friends that are true believers. We're one with uh, other Presbyterians uh, that believe the true gospel. They, we are one together with them, part of the one true church. There are not, in the ultimate sense, multiple churches in that sense on earth. There is one flock and one shepherd, because Jesus said that there would be one flock and one shepherd. That he's, he's the one shepherd, and there's one flock in the world. And that's one thing I've noticed over the years. Um, you meet people from different denominations or different backgrounds, even from different nationalities. You start talking about the gospel and start talking about Jesus and what he means to you, and you find out, this person's my brother, this person's my sister, no matter what the label is or where they're from. You have that in common, and you I've seen that oneness many, many times, and it's a glorious thing. It really is a, a wonderful thing. Now, that doesn't mean that we should have ecclesiastical union with everyone that we have that kind of fellowship with, and that, that's another issue. We may get to that here in a little bit. Okay, Galatians 3.28. You are all one in Christ Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Greek, <clears throat> slave nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So that's the kind of oneness we're talking about. Everyone that is, is clothed with Christ um, is one, is part of the one church. <clears throat> Jesus was not praying for the oneness of his disciples as if he was hoping it would happen. Uh, John 10 and John 17, they're, they're misused by people in an attempt to bring about unity at the expense of truth. When our Lord prayed for unity, that request is fulfilled per in, perfectly in the unity of God's people in the gospel and in, in their all being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They are one, and they've never been anything other than one. They are one, and that they know and believe the one true gospel and are saved by that gospel. There is a glorious unity to the body of Christ on earth in that sense. However, anytime you hear people clamoring for unity between groups which do not agree on the gospel, that is a false unity. That is not the kind of oneness that Jesus is talking about. And so often people will say, can't we be united with with these groups and those groups, and can't, can't we have a, a sense of fellowship with this group and that group? And it depends entirely on whether they preach the true gospel or not, or whether they believe and confess the true gospel and the true God. That's the issue. So unity that is not based on the true gospel, that's not real unity. That's not unity at all. That's not the oneness that Christ prayed for his disciples. While true believers may be divided, sadly, across denominational lines, they're all one in Christ and in the gospel. There is a Catholicity to all of, of Christ's disciples in the world, to all of them, no matter what denomination they're in. <clears throat> and yet, visible divisions go as far back as the churches founded by the apostles in the New Testament itself. So listen, please. When you hear people talking about, well, there was only one church until uh, the 11th century, then the East is split from the West, and then in the West they had this another, you know, blow up in the 16th century. That is so simplistic and naive, and that is not historically accurate. There were divisions and sects and groups forming in the very congregations that were founded by the apostles themselves. I mean, have you ever read 1 Corinthians? Remember what was going on there? I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Cephas. I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Okay, denominationalism did not begin with Protestantism. Unity ought to be labored for by all believers. And if we can't put theological differences on the table, not, not sweep them aside, but put them on the table and be teachable, <clears throat> then we're directly disobeying God's express command to us. Okay? Paul wrote, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of Jesus Christ, that there be no divisions among you. And yet, despite the fact that divisions persist, there's still a oneness to Christ's followers in this world, regardless of the denominational label which they wear. And so we should, in theory, in principle, we should be able to put emotion, tradition aside 
and let someone show us our errors in scripture if we have errors in our theology, if we have errors in our beliefs. We should be able to sit down and go, huh, yeah, I never thought about that. Well, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying. Or or maybe someone walks us through something and we say, no, I don't, you haven't convinced me. I don't, I don't, I don't really see that in this passage. Can you show me more, more closely? Christians ought to be able to do that. And that's something that um, God, God does correct his church. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, one of the functions of scripture is correction. You know, one of the problems with Rome and the East and one of the reasons those religions look as, as strange as they do, where you have people venerating crosses and bowing down in front of things like that and um, worshiping the Virgin Mary, even though they just call it hyperdulia or whatever. Uh, the reason that happens is because they don't believe in Sola Scriptura. If you don't believe in Sola Scriptura, you can't be corrected. You can't be reformed by the voice of God. And that's a tragic thing. Now, <clears throat> all right, where was I here? All right. Um, so that's the church's oneness. There's a oneness of Christ's disciples around the gospel. Second one, holy. One and holy, Catholic apostolic. So holy, what does it mean? The church is holy. Okay, the husbands love your wives, Ephesians 5, 25. Pardon me. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Whoa. <clears throat> that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the church is going to be holy in this world. Not just in the legal and judicial forensic sense in our justification, but also personal sanctification and righteousness is what Jesus came to accomplish in this church. There is no possibility that the true church of Jesus Christ, a truly born again and justified flock in this world, could fail to exhibit real holiness to the world. A worldly church is a contradiction in terms, and it's a denial of the power of God to change people from rebels into loyal adopted children who long to serve Christ. Jesus prayed in John 17, his great high priestly prayer there, John 17, 16, they are not of the world. No, notice that that is an indicative statement of fact. His sheep, the people for whom he's about to give his life on the cross, that he's going to redeem and justify and renew in their hearts and sanctify them, they are not of the world, just as I am out of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. It is not possible that the church could fail to be sanctified, to be made godly by the work of Jesus. So the church is going to be holy. All of God's people have been set apart uh, for God and are in the process of being conformed to the image of Christ in true righteousness and holiness. And the church's holiness will never be perfect in this life, but it is nonetheless real. All who truly know Christ in this world will be holy. To some degree, to some extent, that sanctification process will begin and they will be righteous. They will be godly. They will be obedient. This is the primary reason the New Testament speaks in such strong terms of the need for church discipline among the membership of local churches. Church membership is a great privilege, even though it is often difficult because when you get lots of sinners together and in close proximity to one another, what tends to happen? Sin. Get lots of sinners together, get lots of sin. But a true Christian, whose first priority is the sanctity of Christ's name, will be quick to listen, slow to speak, not easily provoked. <clears throat> true Christians ought to be self-critical and willing to defer to one another and admit wrongdoing to one another. Part of the church's holiness is its willingness and readiness to forgive and restore one another. So that's the church's holiness. There is a holiness, a righteousness to the church. And... When the church refuses to discipline its members, if a church won't hold people to the standard of God's word to obey his law, then the church ceases to be holy. It ceases to be holy. Okay, the church's Catholicity, its universality. This is, this is different from oneness in that the church is the universal church, socially and continuously. Churches which seek only to have members of a certain skin color, education, or, or income level, or nationality, are guilty of violating this attribute. We, we shouldn't have churches that uh, cater to, or, or only, are only friendly to people that, are, that look just like us as, as far as our ethnicity um, or our socioeconomic status or anything like that. The Christian church dealt with this specific issue primarily in the issue of Jews and Gentiles. I mean, we think that we've got differences. Talk about 
groups of people that were, were real different from one another, Jew and Gentile. Gentiles who came to Christ, they didn't have to become Jews in order to have all the privileges of membership in a local church. This was always one of the greatest strengths of the gospel. It united the most unlikely people to one another. People who otherwise would never have had anything to do with each other. And you know the gospel continues to do that to this day. People who are Spanish, people who are French, people who are English, uh, people who are from the Ukraine, from India, from China, Japan, Korea. You know, they have fellowship in Jesus Christ and they can be members of the same local church. Okay. <clears throat> Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you are slain. And have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and language and people and nation. Okay? The church crosses all languages, borders, ethnicities, and skin colors. It's universal in that sense. So everyone that's a Christian um, is a Christian no matter who they are or what they look like or what their preferred uh, style of music is or anything like that. There is a universal Catholicity to the Christian church. Okay, fourth mark of the apostolic marks, the ancient marks, it's apostolicity. The church is one holy, universal, apostolic. Now, this is a real important attribute. you got to catch this one. Are you part of an apostolic church? How do you know that? Well, it's not because it has the name apostolic in it. <clears throat> Only conformity to the apostles' doctrine guarantees that our churches are apostolic. Okay, not that we call ourselves an apostolic church. It doesn't matter. It only matters if... You teach what the apostles taught in Scripture. Is Brittle Heights Presbyterian Church an apostolic church? Okay, Matthew 10, 40. He who receives uh, me, it receives you, receives me. He who receives me, receives him who sent me. Luke 10, 16. He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. He who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. At John 13, 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. Okay, now listen. Why did I just read all those verses? How do we know if we have received the apostles and hear the apostles? Because Jesus said to his apostles, anyone who receives you, receives me. Only if we listen to what they wrote in scripture. Are you a member of an apostolic church? You can know that. You can know if you are or not. How do you know? Uh, do the people in your church and your elders, did they receive what the apostles taught? Jesus said, Matthew 10, 40, he who receives you, speaking, addressing his apostles, receives me. Meaning, whoever listens to your doctrine, who listens to what I have given you to teach, then you can know that you're an apostolic church. Everything in the New Testament was written by an apostle or under apostolic oversight. While we vaguely, excuse me, while we value greatly the writings of great theologians through the centuries, there is no substitute for adherence to the doctrine of the apostles. Okay, now I, I love the church fathers and great theologians and even, you know, people like Anselm in the Middle Ages. There's another fellow named Goschok in the, I think in the 900s or the 800s, I can't remember what, what century he's in. And then you have, you know, the great reformers, the Puritans, their successors, um, modern theologians, R.C. Sproul, Louis Burkhoff, Robert Raymond, Robert Dabney, and many, many, many others. Great writers. I praise God for those men. I praise God for Augustine, for Athanasius, and for Cyprian, and for Ignatius of Antioch, and for others that wrote in the early church period there. Okay, we, we value greatly the writings of great theologians through the centuries. There's no substitute, however, for adherence to the doctrine of the apostles in the New Testament. Remember when the New Testament church first began to explode in numbers at Pentecost? It says that those early Christians in Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Are you part of an apostolic church? Well, if all you ever talk about are church fathers, and we believe what Irenaeus said, and we believe what Cyprian said, we believe what these guys said. The thing is, Irenaeus and Cyprian and all the rest of those men, Tertullian, whoever, they wouldn't want you to believe what they said unless it could be confirmed by Scripture. They wouldn't want you to believe, to go along with what they teach unless it's confirmed by the Word of God, unless it's apostolic doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, it says in Acts 2.42. That's what an apostolic church does. They believe the doctrine of the apostles. Okay, this commitment to the doctrine of the apostles must continue. If it doesn't, the church ceases to be apostolic. In other words, it's not biblical anymore. <clears throat> okay, so those are the four great um, 
teachings, the four great marks of the of the church. And I've got some more stuff here about Rome's interpretation of those. There's no, I don't see any reason to go into that stuff. But I want to get to the uh, uh, to the additional marks of the church that were put. Um, yeah, okay, here, here we go. When the Reformation began to break away from the false doctrines of Rome, <clears throat> since the institutionalized Roman Catholic religion was not open to being corrected by Scripture, the churches of the Reformation were immediately attacked by Rome for not being true Christian churches. That was a big accusation. Because Rome misunderstood the attributes of the church in an almost exclusively institutional and external manner, their basic belief was, if you're not in communion with the Pope, your churches are not one holy Catholic or apostolic. I'm about to sneeze. Mm -hmm. Having misunderstood and misapplied all four attributes, they condemned the churches of the Reformation. Because of these attacks, the Reformers studied the issue of ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church, in Scripture, in much more depth, and came to see what we know today as the marks of the church. Now listen, this is very, very, very important. When you choose a church, when you are trying to look for a church to make your church home, you need to know this stuff. The Protestant reformers could see right away, <clears throat> as they searched the scriptures, that the Roman Catholic religion had interpreted the church in an entirely static way. Now I'm going to explain what I mean by that. The Bible presents us with the marks of the church as things that the church actively does. Okay, so their, their definition of the church is, is more static. It's we can trace our ordinations back. Our, our, our priests and bishops are in union with the right people who are in union with the Bishop of Rome. So it's kind of a static way of looking at it. Whereas the, the Bible presents the marks of a true church in terms of what it's actively doing. You see, it really doesn't matter if you can actually trace historically that your pastors were ordained by a direct line of succession all the way back to the apostles themselves. Even if you could pull that off historically, that does not guarantee that what your pastors teach today is what the apostles taught. And so, the Bible does present us with the idea of apostolic succession, but not apostolic succession of authority or of office, but an apostolic succession of truth. Listen to the word of God, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Not my my authority as an apostle I am passing on to a successor. No, no. It's the things you've heard from me, the doctrines I taught you, the Christian faith you learned from me, the system of truth I have taught you. Commit that system of truth to others who will be able to commit that same system of truth to others. And at any given point, the people that we teach, they may rise up and become heretics. And should we say, should the apostles have said, and no matter what they ever teach, because we ordained them, they're good. They're our successors. No, they're held just like the apostles themselves were held to the standard of God's word. That's why it's so amazing. I've always wondered, how, how, do, how does Rome and, and the East counter the fact that Paul says in Galatians 1, if I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, well, let him be anathema. Well, isn't Paul an apostle? He's saying, if I come back and preach to you, I thought that they had this great authority and the apostles and their successors. You, you have to be in union with them and have to listen to everything they say. Paul is saying, no, it's the gospel that's authoritative, not me. Only insofar as I'm faithful to the truth of the Christian faith should you listen to me. The things you have heard from me. It's the text that's inspired of scripture, not the apostles. <clears throat> what is Paul passing on to Timothy? His office as an apostle? No. Some kind of authoritative position? No. What Paul passed on and what has been passed on to us here is the things you have heard from me. In other words, the faith, the doctrines of the faith. And it is these truths that Timothy is to commit to faithful men who will also commit them to others. We're also called upon to disciple others. The Reformation, um, the Reformation could see that the four attributes were indeed biblical and correct, one holy Catholic apostolic, not as Rome taught them, but as Scripture teaches them. But there was something more. The Church of Jesus Christ is manifested not just in those biblical attributes, <clears throat> one holy Catholic apostolic, but also by what it actively does and is engaged in. Each local congregation is defined by what it's engaged in and what it actively does week in and week out. There are so many groups today which claim to be churches. Okay, that word, C-H-U-R-C-H, kind of scandalous when you look in the phone book, but... There are so many groups that say we are churches. How can we know 
which ones are true churchism, which ones are not. This is a critical point I pray that everyone will understand fully. The church in the Bible cannot be understood primarily in static terms. It's not a bare institution of offices traceable to the time of the apostles. The church in the Bible is what it is because of its attributes and its marks, namely by what it actively does. The Westminster Confession, chapter 25.4. This Catholic church, this universal church, church, hath been sometimes more, sometimes less visible, and particular churches, which are members thereof, are more or less pure, according as the doctrine of the gospel is taught and embraced. Notice what they're saying. How do you know if your church is a true church, or if it's part of this church, or how pure is it? Depends on how accurately the, the gospel is taught and embraced. And B, ordinances administered. C, public worship performed more or less purely in them. So whether your church is pure or impure or somewhere in the middle is going to depend on what it's doing week in and week out. Not who ordained who and who's connected to this or connected to that. It's what the church actively does. Is the doctrine of the gospel taught and embraced? The ordinances, the sacraments are administered correctly? And public worship is performed more or less purely in them? And that's the teaching of scripture. Remember the letters that Jesus had dictated to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3. He would recommend, he would commend them for some things. He would also tell them what they were doing wrong. Okay, when the churches of Galatia were toying with the false gospel, Paul is clear to them that if they embrace that doctrine, they will cease to be considered within the kingdom of God. Now, now think about that. So Paul's saying it's a real possibility for churches that I planted and that I built and I was part of and ordained people in, it's possible for them to cease to be a true church. Well, why, why would they cease to be a true church if they don't? actively preach the true gospel anymore. See how that works? It has nothing to do with who ordained who. It's do you teach what the apostles teach? There is no sense at all in scripture that if an apostle founded your church and ordained your bishop, you're a true church. That's no part of biblical truth, my friends. In fact, Paul even says that if another apostle contradicts the message of the gospel, that person, whoever they are, is under God's curse. They're anathema. Galatians 1, 6-9. A church's status as a true church of Christ was based upon the level of ongoing and active faithfulness to the teachings of Scripture, the teachings of the apostles, and the purity of the worship of God. This is what the Reformers saw in Scripture. It's not a matter of what, what bishops your local church is in fellowship with, but rather is the doctrine of the gospel taught and embraced actively. Are the ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, administered correct, correctly, actively? And is the worship of God regulated by scripture in that place? Those are the things that determine whether or not you're in a true church. The reformers pointed to two basic marks of the church in addition to the four attributes and it eventually added a third one. And they were, as I already stated, number one, the right preaching of the word of God and the gospel. Notice it's an activity that the church is engaged in. The right preaching, the ongoing correct preaching of the word of God and the gospel. Secondly, the right administration of the sacraments, which is an activity ongoing. And then thirdly, church discipline. Okay, first, the right preaching of the word of God and the gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit breathed forth the following soul-stirring charge to Timothy and to all ministers of the gospel. Every time I read this passage, it gives me the chills. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 4.1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and is appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. That means when it's convenient and when it's not convenient, you preach it. You preach what it says, no matter what. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. In other words, there will be no shortage of heretics and false teachers who will say whatever they think people want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. And I would say, just sitting here in my, in my office here in Kingsport, I would say to you, to Rome, to the East, to anyone listening, to any pastor, whoever hears this, if in your building that wears the label C-H-U-R-C-H, -H, church, this is not happening, you don't have the right preaching of the word of God, you don't have a church. If the gospel is not clearly preached and proclaimed and repentance called for and faith in Christ alone 
elicited, you're not in a church. You don't have a church. Where the word of God is not read, labored over, exposited, accurately interpreted, preached, taught, applied, and embraced. I don't care how many generations backward you can trace ordinations. That place is not a church. Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the place where the ministry of the word is heard every single week, every time, without fail. And if it doesn't, you may have had a gathering of Christian people. You may have had an emotional experience of some kind. You may have heard beautiful music with people that can really sing and really play well. You may have heard a motivational speech and some sentimental stories that drew some tears from your eyes and pulled at your heartstrings. But where the word of God is not actively week in and week out being preached, that place is not in any sense a church. Jesus said in John 8, 31, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. John 14, 23, he also said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And the Apostle Paul was so forcefully in favor of the idea of the truth of the gospel trumping apostolic authority that he even told the Galatian churches, even if we come back and preach a different gospel, may we be damned. Forget the idea of an apostolic succession of office. These people were warned by the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul's letter to them in the Galatian region there that if Paul himself comes to them and tells them something different, may Paul himself be damned instantly on the spot. The fact is, people can claim and even prove all day that their pastors can trace their ordinations all the way back to the apostles. If they don't teach what the apostles taught, no one should listen to them. The right preaching of the word of God, first mark. Second mark, the right administration of the sacraments. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives detailed instructions on how the Lord's Supper is to be observed in the church. And baptism is likewise a definitional mark of the Christian people. Lord Jesus instituted baptism when he gave his great commission. Go therefore make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The right preaching of the gospel, the right administration of the sacraments for a church to be a true Christian church, it must actively be engaged in these activities. Now, the third mark of a true Christian church is discipline, church discipline. Why are local churches often scorned as judgmental, bigoted, or self-righteous? Because some actually require their members to be repentant believers who seek to follow Christ in the way they live their lives. Remember one of the attributes of the church? is holy. The New Testament is filled with very serious, very strict admonitions to purge wicked, unrepentant people from the church. To purge them from the church. Listen carefully to Jesus concerning a sinning brother who refuses to repent. Matthew 18, 17, if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Galatians 6 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, meaning you who are Christians, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, consider, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. 1 Corinthians 5 13. Put away from yourselves the evil person, meaning the unrepentant evil person. 1 Corinthians 5 9 through 11. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So someone who says they're a Christian, someone who claims to be a Christian and lives a life of unrepentant sin like that, you can't even eat with them. You can't keep company with them. Now, so many people say, oh, that's so mean, that's so horrible. No, that's, that's one of the means by which God often draws people back to himself. 2 John 1, 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Not supposed to show hospitality to heretics. The Reformation of the 16th century was one of the greatest movements of the Holy Spirit of God since the days of the Apostles of Christ. The Word of God and its simple doctrines regarding authority, salvation, the church, sacraments, etc. have been buried by layer after layer of unbiblical traditions, practices, and superstition. But when the people began to read the Bible again, its light began to dispel the darkness. That's why the Great Reformation slogan, Post Tenebras, looks after darkness, light. 
Not only were the Bible and the gospel recovered, but the biblical doctrine of the church was recovered. A biblical view of the local church is essential to the entire church's health in this world. Gone were popes, cardinals, priests, and five unbiblical sacraments. Gone were popes who murdered their predecessors to gain that office. Gone were men who bought and sold the papacy and bought and sold church offices. And what replaced these things? A biblical doctrine of ecclesiology, a biblical doctrine of the church. The wicked and evil people were purged out of the church and it became a holy communion of saints and their children again. The plague of vile doctrines was also purged out. The mass, indulgences, purgatory, relics, icons, mariolatry, and penance. And they were replaced with the glorious and pristine Pauline doctrine of the simple justification of the sinner by faith alone apart from works. And I want you to consider one final thought regarding a biblical doctrine of the church, a biblical ecclesiology. The idea that the reading and expository preaching of scripture would stand at the center of Christian worship was a foreign concept in the 16th century. The Reformation recovered it, the idea of preaching, and put the word of God in its rightful place. The theologian Louis Burkhoff said this, quote, Strictly speaking, it may be said that the true preaching of the word of God and its recognition as the standard of doctrine and life is the one mark of the church. Without it, there is no church. And it determines the right administration of the sacraments and the faithful exercise of church discipline. In other words, what Burkhoff's emphasizing there is everything goes back to the word of God, to scripture. That, that's the standard. That's the ultimate mark of the Christian church. It has the word of God and it believes the word of God and practices the word of God. Theologians long ago spoke of the church triumphant, those currently in the bliss of heaven with Christ right now. That's what the church triumphant is. And they also spoke of the church militant, and that's those who are currently on earth in the midst of difficulty, struggles, and hardship. We are the church militant right now, brothers and sisters. And yet there are so few who really have a passion for their local church. There are few who really are really militant for the sake of the health of the local church. Church in America in 2022 has become a competitive marketplace, devolving into shallow entertainment, a fear of offending people, and wishy-washy emotional pep talks that are very smarmy. Smarmy, that's S-M-A-R-M-Y. That is excessively emotional and to the point that it's obviously insincere. You have that instead of expositional preaching and application of the word of God with passion. Will you have a biblical doctrine of the church? Will you love your local church? Will you pray for your pastors, your elders, your deacons? Will you teach your children how to discern between a faithful church and an unfaithful church? Will your children go to the church that has the cool music that they like, but little faithful proclamation of the word of God, little concern for the personal holiness of its members, and little respect and use for the sacraments Jesus gave us? Or will they stand their ground as part of the church militant? Will they be able to find the word of God preached in this nation? Will your children and grandchildren go to church where will they go to church? Where will they go to church if we don't teach them how to find a church and how to be part of their church and how to love the church? Will there be any Christians left in this baby-murdering, self-centered, perverted nation that we find ourselves in these days? You and your family and your descendants, listen to me, please. You and your family and your descendants have no hope and no future apart from the existence of healthy, godly, biblical local churches in their neighborhoods. And so, whatever else you might have going on in your life, whatever other interests you have in this world, you must pray that God would bless you and your descendants and your church with a biblical ecclesiology. And I say to you, love the church of Christ and love your local church. Thank you for watching or for listening.